Greetings, welcome to the Transforming Assessment webinar series. Uh, this uh, week we have a special uh, assessment in higher education joint session. Uh, it's a panel review from the uh, 2018 conference day in the UK. Um, I would like to first introduce uh, Professor Sally Jordan who will talk a little bit about what happened in assessment in higher education this year. So take it away, Sally. Thank you, Matthew, and good morning, everyone, from uh, not quite so sunny Milton Keynes this morning, but for those of you who don't know, it's been amazing in the UK, the weather, uh, most untypical. Um, so uh, that's actually in reached, included uh, the day of the Assessment in Higher Education conference, which was at the end of June in Manchester. Um, just a bit of background, um, so AHE, the, the main conference, now runs biennially, so it, it ran last year and it will run next year, it's a two-day two conference, um, but we, the organising committee, decided that uh, to keep the interest going, we would have a sort of one small one-day event uh, between the main conferences. Uh, trouble is, small has got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, there were 150 delegates at the conference this year, and I think we're fairly close to making the decision to run the conference every year because there's clearly a need for it, which is fantastic. It's, it's, it's great to see a conference that kind of goes from strength to strength. This year, the uh, theme of the conference was feedback. And uh, we had David Carlis over from Hong Kong giving the keynote. And just to set the scene for uh, today's webinar, I just want to highlight uh, three things actually that David said. Um, the first thing was he, um, the quote is from a recent paper of uh, David Carlis and David Bowds, which I would recommend to you. I'll do what David said. I haven't got it reference given, but it, it's um, gold open access. So if you just uh, Google Carlis and Bowd and feedback, you'll find it. Um, and they have very much emphasized the fact that feedback doesn't become feedback until it's acted on by learners. Um, and I think that's something that we keep on forgetting, and I think it's it's worthy of, of note. Um, later on in the conference, somebody asked about how that relates to technology-enabled feedback, uh, you know, how that could be used and, and obviously there's a danger. There's a danger that we get into a mindset where feedback is something that we give to students rather than being the other way around. So anyway, just something to think about as we're as we're going through this morning. Um, the second thing I want to emphasize, actually I haven't got on the slide, and that's a reminder that feedback given at the end of a learning process, where that might be right at the end of a degree program, I think if it's somewhere in the middle it's, it's, it's less certain, but actually if you give feedback when there's no time for students to, make, to use it to make a difference, maybe that's not such a useful thing. And the third thing that David pointed out was this idea of provocative feedback. Um, it's a lovely slide, took this photograph from the conference there. Um, he was talking about an example of some, um, shall we say, slightly um, maybe upsetting feedback that he received a very long time ago, uh, where his supervisor back in 1983 said, yes, it's all very good and fine, but where's the pizzazz? And it was just an interesting point about the idea that feedback becomes quite useful if you are actually, you're made to really think about it. This is something provocative about it. Anyway, it was a great one day conference. At the end, I'll give you the links for more information for the uh, 2019 proper conference. But that's for the future for today. Um, we've got three of the speakers from the conference who are going to highlight what they talked about. And if we're looking for a theme for this, I think it's probably sticking with the feedback theme from the main conference, but something digital about it. So at which point I will stop talking and hand over to our first speaker, who is Teresa. Oh, good morning or good evening or whatever to everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I want to, uh, to, to present the, the, some of the outcomes from a, a three-year initiative that's been uh, trying to enhance student engagement in a module by changing the feedback strategy. Um, and particularly, we, we tried to do this by introducing an online 
um, portfolio assessment. Um, so but just to give you a bit of background, this, this, this relates to a first year core academic skills module. Um, and it's taken by about six different degree disciplines around geography and environmental science subjects. And um, the, the usual way that the, the module is delivered was through small group weekly tutorials and the assessment was a portfolio of different academic skills activities such as critical reading, uh, scientific writing, all that sort of thing. Um, the problem that, that we encountered was that students, instead of bringing work with them every week as they were supposed to do and engaging with these tasks on a weekly basis, they weren't doing that. That means that they weren't able to benefit from feedback given during the tutorials. Um, it affected the running of the tutorials and it meant that tutors weren't really able to see how they were progressing. So we switched the, the printed portfolio for an online portfolio. We, we used WordPress to, uh, for, to get students to create the portfolios. And we felt that if tutors were able to access these online portfolios, um, they would be able to monitor their progress, whether or not students brought work along to the tutorials. They could give regular written feedback through the comments tool on the website and, and that that would encourage timely progress. This is the plan. <laughs> um, we, we actually implemented this change over the course of three years and in the first two years we split the cohort into approximately, uh, it was not quite 50-50, um, so we had some students submitting their portfolio in the traditional way, the printed copy, and some submitting um, in the, uh, using the online method. And um, we, we evaluated the whole process to see how it went to staff and students using a questionnaire survey. And we got very high return rates over the three years of, um, well, almost, uh, in, uh, almost everybody from the tutors and uh, at least three quarters of the students. So uh, quite a nice range of, of uh, feedback obtained. Um, so I'll pick out just some of the, uh, a, a sort of snapshot of some of the different topics that were raised in the feedback that we got from students and staff. So from students, for example, um, there was a lot in their feedback comments about the, the process of, of both um, uploading their work and receiving feedback. They found the whole process much easier than, than bringing handwritten or typed up work along to tutorials. They could just upload it to their website and feel confident that their tutors were, would access it uh, before they met at the next tutorial. They found the whole process uh, easy, uh, it was clear, they were able to get a rapid response from their tutors. Um, they liked getting high frequency feedback, but they also were quite willing to accept the blame if, uh, if they didn't get it. So you look at that second uh, quotation there, if I'd updated my WordPress more regularly, then my tutor would have been able to leave more useful comments. So, so they're, they're acknowledging that sometimes um, they were to blame if, uh, if, if they didn't get the feedback. Um, and if they didn't get regular feedback, um, they obviously wanted more, so only giving feedback for one task, but if I was given feedback for all tasks, it would have been far more helpful. And then uh, a couple of other bits from students. The, the format of the feedback, um, they, the, the, the sort of um, the content that students were getting in their feedback and the timing, um, how regular it was, whether it was very generic or very specific, these were all things that students commented on. But they did all, it did also affect their behaviour, so that if, if, um, if tutors didn't provide those online comments to students, um, they tended not to bother uploading stuff um, in subsequent weeks. Um, 
there were a very high proportion of the comments that students made that were around how useful the feedback was. So this is a, a word cloud of all of the text comments contained in the, the survey and you can see the words that are really sticking out there are useful, improve, help, work, uh, gave comments, etc. So um, students found the, the, the regular feedback comments extremely useful in helping them to improve their future work. So this is the, um, the so-called feed forward. From a tutor's perspective, they also found the whole process easier. Many tutors preferred using the online environment rather than handwriting or, or typing feedback uh, on, on downloaded work. Uh, they found the process uh, simpler and more straightforward. Um, for, for many tutors, they had an intention to to provide the, the feedback on a weekly basis. Um, but in some cases, if students, if, if the um, uploading of work started to tail off, then so did uh, the feedback that, that tutors gave. And um, there was a recognition that, that for many tutors, they actually had more time to give individual formative feedback that they simply didn't have time in, in the tutorial classes to do before. And, and obviously in a tutorial class, um, you've got the whole group there together, so you're not really giving individual feedback, it's more generic. A um, couple of other things about the tutor experience. So in terms of the, the format, um, as I say, most tutors really engaged in this new process and uh, looked at the online portfolios every week and provided written comments in the, using the comments tool in WordPress. But there were a variety of, of other methods used. So some people didn't provide any written comments at all. They just gave generic feedback in the class, um, some handwrote comments, etc. So there's still, still some inconsistencies there. Um, there was a, a recognition from staff that, that their co because they were giving these comments much more regularly, that, that students were acting on that and improving their work for the following session. Um, and looking at some of the comments from staff, um, it wasn't just feedback about uh, what they've done correctly, what they haven't done correctly, but there was also guidance being provided. So informing them of missing work, encouraging them, supporting them. Um, I said that, that we evaluated the project through the questionnaire survey, but um, I also did an analysis of student grades comparing the, uh, the grades for the printed portfolio with those for the online portfolio. And um, you can see the, the, the four phases along the bottom. So phase zero is before we introduce the online portfolio at all. And phase three is when uh, all students are doing the online portfolio. And I know there's a bit of noise in the data. Um, there is a statistically significant difference between um, the, two, the, the two groups uh, with the online portfolio. Uh, getting higher grades. Um, as I say, it, it's difficult to draw really firm conclusions from that because there, there are sorts of other influences going on as well. But uh, nevertheless, it's, it's a good sign. Um, so in terms of the, the outcomes of, of this switch to the online portfolio, some of the wider benefits are that, that both staff and students were able to monitor progress much more effectively. There's certainly evidence that students had a better grasp of, of how to get, uh, how to reach a higher standard, what was required of them. They learnt from each other, uh, not just from looking at each other's sites uh, in, in a tutorial class um, and learning from each other in that way, but also gaining the motivation to, to make faster progress or better progress 
uh, by comparing their work with others. Um, in terms of student engagement, the, the lower quotation there, um, a lot more students kept up with the tasks that went along in comparison to last year. So that, that's a really uh, nice finding. And, and that's certainly reflected in, in the, the um, students' positive experience of this whole process. However, the challenges that remain um, are, are largely around inconsistency. So on the one hand, we've got students clearly engaging, but then the, some tutors' experience was that students weren't engaging with the process despite uh, being reminded. Um, but there's also inconsistency from tutors as well, with a, a lack of, I guess, what you could call buy-in. Uh, and and this, this obviously has a, a negative effect on, on the student experience. Um, I'm going to switch to the, the final slide now. The, um, so the conclusions are that we've, um, by providing this very regular, prompt, online feedback, um, and that, that that tends to facilitate the whole ability of both staff and students to monitor progress. That encourages engagement um, in the unit or the module itself. Um, it, it improves the grasp of standards and self-reflection and so on, um, and, and starts to move towards um, what, what David Carlos was talking about was, was having better dialogue and, and learner agency. Um, so I'm sure you don't want to, to read through all the, the sources there, so I'll just, uh, I'll just say thank you for listening. I'm um, happy to answer any questions at this point. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, I heard a, um, a th there's one question, factual question, come from um, Matthew himself, who I'm sure can ask it himself. Uh, around, uh, uh, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot there to talk about later. There's a lot about the idea of moving, uh, you know, move, monitoring progress, moving towards dialogue, but. Uh, Matthew, you had a question about the how it compares with what was done in the past. Uh, yes, I was just wondering, um, and I, I think you sort of did answer it a little bit, um, about <coughs> whether the digital portfolios were used in the face-to-face -face classes, because it seems that the uh, paper-based uh, portfolios were. Is that right? The, the paper-based portfolios, yes. The students were expected to bring work each week along to the tutorials, um, but, but often they didn't. You know, they forgot it, the dog ate it, um, <laughs> whatever. But with the <laughs> online portfolio, the, the crucial difference is that the tutors had um, access all the time to their portfolios, so they could see how they were progressing, and they could also display those portfolios in the tutorials for the whole class to see. But when I say whole class, we're talking five or six students, probably. Okay, so there was reference of the digital digital portfolios in the face-to-face -face class. I'm just wondering if there was a sort of a diversion of it or whether they were merging together and it seems the latter was the case. Um, I'm not, sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is when, when things go online and the tutor can access and give feedback out of class hours, Oh, then yeah. there may have been a tendency for that stuff to be separated from the things that happened in the face-to-face -face class. Right. Yes, I've got you. Um, yeah, so uh, what we, we tried to, I mean, I guess that, that's a danger, but we tried to overcome that by um, encouraging tutors to, to actually display the, the portfolios in class so that they, they could have right. a discussion yeah. around it, feedback, generic feedback, and so on, yeah. Yeah, uh, and as Mark has pointed out in the text chat, the tutor was not seeing the uh, that that piece of work for the first time when they see yes, it in the classroom. They've had some time to think about it, so you know there are some right, advantages yes. that way as well. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right. I think we probably need to move on to our next speaker, uh, which will be I think it's Mark. <laughs> Let me just change the slide. Ding. There we go. Okay, can you hear me okay? 
Yes, all good. Take it away. Perfect. Thank you very much, and and thank you for the uh, first talk. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> so my name is is Mark Lynn, and I head up the teaching and learning unit, which we call the teaching enhancement unit in Dublin City University. And I'm here speaking on behalf of colleagues and uh, the, the practitioners, the people at the cold face, uh, Evelyn, Adele, Anna, and Colette, and they're really the brains behind this initiative. I'm just coming in from the teaching and learning side of you, but these are the people, as I say, at the cold face. And I've put my Twitter handle down the bottom of the page if anybody wants to to uh, follow us afterwards or to follow up with any any particular comments or questions. So um, we had an assessment challenge, and the challenge was uh, we have a range of clinical skills within nursing, everything from bed making, taking blood pressure, washing hands, drug administration, and aseptic techniques. Um, even though by themselves, individually, they're all small activities, they're all relatively straightforward to do and to assess. Um, but when you have, in our case, um, each one of these skills have to be assessed. They ha on an individual basis, they have to be assessed because before we send our students out on work placement, as will be the case in every other um, institution doing a, a nursing qualification, as we send them out, these clinical skills are core. We can't send them out without them knowing how to do these. The logistics from our point of view, 200 plus students every year. Uh, if we just look at the OSCEs, these clinical um, skills, uh, there's five assessments which we need to do, and at the very minimum, if you're talking about five minutes per assessment, we needed 10 lectures just to manage first year assessments, just for the OSCEs. Um, 10 lecturers had to set aside two weeks of their time, and it's no exaggeration to say that we had a, a conveyor belt of students literally passing through in front of all of these different lectures and doing their five minutes one-off performance of this practical skill. So that's that's the background as to what we've done. Um, that led to challenges of inconsistent marking, of uh, exam performance anxiety, of all sorts of, of different bits and pieces, never mind the fact that we had to take out two weeks of the semester just to manage assessments. And semesters are short enough, as you know. So we didn't need any, any help making them shorter. So um, what did we do? Uh, and I'll paste in a video which will actually show this in, in, in action um, of, of the two nurses. And just for, for simplicity's sake, let's just call them Kate and Mary. Uh, Kate is recording Mary doing this particular skill, so one of, Kay, uh, one of our colleagues, she's recording doing it, and then they will submit this video uh, to the lecturer uh, as part of their assessment when they are ready. But what happens there is, as Kate is recording Mary, she's able to give her feedback. She's having peer, peer review. Rather than peer evaluation, it's peer review. She's also learning from our colleague who's watching it. So it's a learning process, an assessment of learning, an assessment as learning, an assessment for, uh, for learning, all combined into one process. The student can repeat it as often as they like. Nerves doesn't necessarily come into it, doesn't detract from the performance. And with these clinical skills, with these practical skills, repetition is key. So everything is actually informing and, and of benefit to the student. Um, I won't necessarily say the, the assessment becomes um, an enjoyable activity, but what I will say is that the students actually ended up using this for so many different other clinical skills uh, because they enjoyed the way it was done. Uh, nobody likes getting assessment, but the way it was done, they particularly enjoyed. So. In terms of feedback, um, I did mention earlier on we had 10 different lectures and each of them had a paper-based rubric which they marked off and added their comments with. Um, we decided to improve this process because Evelyn, the lady spearheading this process, had to take those paper-based uh, rubrics from every single lecture, collate them all, and then provide feedback to the students whenever she got the chance to actually meet them, which typically was a long time after the assessment. So we put in the uh, rubrics in Moodle, which is our learning management system, and put in frequently used comments. So the lecturer was able to give the same level of consistency of feedback to the students 
um, and no matter how tired she was, no matter whether the student was first or, or last on, on the queue. And that consistent level of feedback and those frequently used comments she was able to then use in advance of the assessment the following year to give the students essentially the opportunity for feed forward, uh, for want of a better phrase. So um, in terms of feedback, the process was much better. Also, because the, the lecturer had a video of the assessment, a video of the performance of the assessment, instead of referring to a, um, to a, a paper-based rubric, the, video, uh, the lecturer can actually refer specifically back to a point in time in the, vi in, in the video. So at 1 minute 57, you didn't do this. At 1 minute 20, you did this, and so on. So the, the feedback became much more powerful and it went from a monologue, so from the lecture just transmitting feedback through this paper-based uh, format, to being a dialogue because students engaged with the feedback an awful lot more. So they were giving feedback to one another uh, before the lecturer even seen the assignment submission and then the feedback was improved between the lecturer and the student as well. So. Uh, we were very, very happy with the process and, and the efficiencies that we gained both in terms of, of the learning but also the uh, administration aspect of it and, and the pure organization aspect of it too. So we asked the students how did they feel about it. Uh, we, we evaluated them over a, a number of years, a number of different cohorts, but overall the four um, findings that came from time and time again. They loved having more time to practice. They loved having less pressure. And they loved the, the fact that it was easy to record and they could submit when they were happy. The feedback that we got from staff, they were overall incredibly positive about it. Um, they really valued being able to take a break when they're tired. As I said, 200 plus students with all the best intentions at heart, you are going to be tired by the time you get to student 190. So um, this allowed, it removed the conveyor belt um, process and allowed the, the lecturer to look at and review the assignment submissions when he or she is ready. The fact that they could rewind the video to look again if they think they missed it, and you know, which was the most uh, beneficial one or, or at least highlighted the most often, is they could refer back to the video if there was a disputed result. We've all had it where a student said, oh, I didn't do that. You said I got this wrong and I didn't. Well, now we have video evidence to prove it. We won't mention uh, the World Cup and VAR at the moment, but too topical. But they were more confident uh, of the consistent marking and they could discuss the differences and agree to mark. And that goes back to the dialogue rather than monologue when it came back to, um, to the use of, of this technology. So uh, just sort of summarizing the, the efficiencies that we got, we had efficiency in student learning because the students had peer review before it. They learned off one another. They could practice as often as they like. So if it was a quality box, I'd be ticking that right now. The feedback that they received, they received feedback from one another, but also better and more consistent feedback from um, the, the staff member or members involved. Career development. Career development is important because what we did was we encouraged the students to integrate these videos into their e-portfolio and then they're able to highlight them when it comes to work placement and indeed when they're in work placement they can refer back to those videos just to give them a little bit more of a refresher. We had the, um, from a staff point of view, as I said, the assessment, the process was improved. But the, the one I really want to highlight here is the fact that the feedback provided was more consistent. The feedback provided became a dialogue. The students got engaged with it. So the lecturers actually felt more involved and more um, enthused by this particular uh, assignment, what could be, as you can appreciate, a very tedious assignment. And again, huge savings in staff time. Went from involving 10 lectures over two weeks to one lecture over two weeks. So our efficiencies were, we were delighted with them. Um, now, what we're looking at is transferability here. So we looked at this for taking, um, washing hands was our initial ones. Well, now our students are doing it, and what I, I um, alluded to at the start was our students started using this for other techniques, other OSCEs, that they weren't required to do, but we found them practicing up in the labs, recording one another, learning from one another, nothing to do with an assessment. 
and the student very uh, briefly would start a video by holding up a page with their student name and number and then they would perform the task and they're learning from one another again so we were really really happy with it so to summarize beforehand it was a very stressful logistic nightmare for the lecturer and a very stressful performance anxiety related nightmare for the students um, and afterwards well we're all incredibly relaxed about it and we're now expanding it to all of the SBs in the first year and um, we're getting great engagement from other staff in second year and third year uh, modules as well so I appreciate I was going through that at, at a whirlwind speed but if you do want to contact us there's my details there and um, to add to it and probably uh, explain it in a much more articulate fashion um, I have the lady herself Evelyn Kelleher speaking here on this YouTube video actually explaining the process and, and what we've done what I will say is, is Steven Spielberg has nothing to worry about the video work um, that's done here because of me that's behind the camera at the time so hopefully that proves useful for you that was fantastic Mark thank you very much indeed um, again uh, there's a lot of discussion being going on and I think perhaps the issue around the importance of consistency of feedback is one that we can pick up in discussion at the end um, but I would question and there's there's certainly a few that have come in the chat box um, it's around this, um, my question is around the, you were talking about peer, uh, well, peer review, certainly. Um, is that, so if one student's filming the other student, is that literally, do they, are they giving feedback as they go, or are they just, they're, they're doing the recording, but then giving feedback, or, or, or is it just informal? It's it's a hundred percent up to the students in question. Um, there's no sound in the video, or at least no sounds required in the video, so they can do whatever they like there in terms of stop halfway through or uh, give feedback at the very end. Uh, they can uh, the flexibility is a hundred percent with the student. That's great, thank you. And Ruth asked a question, which you can probably see yourself there. It's, it's, is there an issue if students film their videos in clinical settings uh, to do with patient confidentiality? So in, in our case, in these cases, they're done in the labs in the, in the university itself. So, and they're not done on, and if I say this in inverted commas, real patients, uh, which, um, and I'll give a, a plug to the conference that you mentioned at the start. One of the excellent presentations that I came across there was, the student talking about um, he was a paramedic and how when the students were patients themselves and being treated by other uh, by their student colleagues they're learning as well so by uh, not using real patients and using the students as patients um, the patient learns as well as the person doing the work no that's great thank you very much indeed um, I think probably it's sensible that we move on to a Naomi so she has a chance for her talk and we'll come back to the discussion later but that was great thank you thank you hello everybody um, my presentation follows on I think quite nicely from some of the things that uh, we've been hearing about in this session um, in particular, I think uh, what Sally said right at the beginning about feedback not being feedback and that's acted upon is something that's had a big influence on my thinking around feedback and the work that um, myself and Emma have been doing within our, our lab at Surrey. So what I want to show with you today is some information about a tool that we developed uh, at Surrey. Um, and this really draws upon um, our knowledge from many, many examples within the literature that feedback has the potential to be one of the very strongest influences on students' learning. However, we often don't really know what students do with, with feedback. Academics spend a very long time uh, carefully crafting comments to guide students' future learning, but we don't really know what happens next. Um, and we often make assumptions about students' engagement based on what we can see. 
Uh, so I was at a university uh, in the UK a few weeks ago, and one of the things that I saw in a, in a corridor was a set of pigeonholes with student assignments that had been marked, and there were piles and piles of them that hadn't been collected. And so I think this is often an assumption that we make that students aren't interested in feedback because they don't pick it up. But actually there's a lot more going on beneath the surface that we don't really know about. And so getting to this issue of the impact of feedback is something that I think is really important. And uh, Margaret Price talks about um, the invisibility of student engagement with feedback. And I think that really represents this fact that we don't know what happens, what happens next. How do students use feedback? Do they understand it? Uh, what do they do next? What actions do they take? So we were trying to find ways of, of understanding the answers to some of these questions. And we recognise that with many of the uh, moves to electronic management of assessment, students leave digital footprints essentially um, can perhaps give us some insight into student engagement with feedback. Now learning analytics or, or feedback analy analytics as they're sometimes called is still uh, I think we could say an emerging field and we have to be cautious with how we interpret those analytics but by looking at how students engage with feedback in virtual learning environments um, there is potential there to uncover this kind of hidden invisible recipients of feedback and so this led us to conduct a project which we called the Feedback Footprints Project which was looking at how learning analytics could help us to understand engagement with feedback but also be used to inform student action on the basis of feedback information. So there is some work uh, within the literature, mainly conference papers actually, um, that are looking at, at feedback analytics, so information from learning management systems about how feedback is, is being engaged with. Um, typical measures that we would see within these kinds of systems are the number of students opening feedback, how long they look at it for, how many times they look at their feedback. Um, Obviously some of these, these measures could be misleading because just because the student opens the feedback and has it open for 20 minutes doesn't mean that there's been any meaningful engagement with that information. But it does give us some early indication of, of, of at least a surface level of student engagement. So this example here from Arden Stansfield um, represents a system they developed called My Feedback where the tutor could see uh, all of their students and whether they had read their feedback and how many times they'd looked at it. Um, and as this chart on the right hand side of the screen shows, the majority of students only read their feedback once. Now we have I think a lot of uh, common sense views um, that students only really look at feedback once. But here we can see analytics being useful in, in actually showing us that information and which students are the ones who, who look at it more than once, for example. Uh, a more promising use of analytics to specifically explore the impact of feedback comes from a study by Zimbardi and colleagues um, where they tracked students' engagement with feedback. And this time uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated because they weren't just looking at the number of times uh, feedback was looked at or how long it was open for, but they actually tracked student clicks um, whilst engaging with the feedback. And they did this with groups of students who over the course of a semester were doing a series of reports, um, lab report style assessments. And what their data show um, is that students who spent longer with their feedback improved more and more quickly than those who spent less time engaging with their feedback. So we get some indication here of the impact of engagement with feedback, which could perhaps be quite powerful information to show to students themselves so that they can see how the use of feedback can have an impact on future grades. But these analytics that I've just shown you, both examples are staff-facing analytics. These are for educators to see what students are doing. And for us, we felt quite strongly that if we want uh, feedback and specifically students' engagement with feedback to promote self-regulation, um, then it's actually students that need to see this information.
information representing their own engagement so that they can see where the impact is coming and adjust their future behaviour. And I think probably the most common example of, of an analytics dashboard that we would see in everyday life is, is the output from uh, activity trackers such as um, the Fitbit. And when we think about the purpose of the dashboard within a Fitbit, it is not for um, a company or for a personal trainer primarily. This information is for the individual so they can see what they're doing. They can see how their engagement with exercise, what they've been eating, how all of this information comes together to inform their uh, understanding of, of um, their, their change in fitness or their change in, in weight, for example. So this is very much about self-regulation and the individual having access to this information. And so we wanted to see if we could do something similar for students with, with feedback. So we developed an online uh, virtual learning environment e-portfolio called Seats, and we designed this in collaboration with students. So they told us what would be most useful for them, and we used that as the basic design brief that we then gave to learning technologists to help us design this tool. I've put a video link there if you're interested in seeing some screencasts of how the tool works. But basically, there are three sections within the tool. The first section is a feedback review and synthesis tool. So this is an opportunity for students to create a space for all of their feedback in one place. And that's not just formal feedback from assessments, but also perhaps verbal feedback, um, the outcomes of discussions with a tutor or a peer, or even their own self-assessment. And this enables students to see how multiple markers are perhaps telling them similar things about what they need to do uh, to improve their work. There are then analytics that come out of that feedback review that shows them the, the, the most common things that they're being told um, through their feedback. Based on that information, the second section is then a skill development tool which consists of a, a large resource bank where students can um, go and access podcasts, papers, books, uh, book onto workshops, for example, to develop particular elements of their skills. And then the final section is an action planning tool. So based on the resources they've decided to engage with, uh, it populates an action planning tool which sets out what they're going to do to use their feedback and also to encourage links uh, to personal tutors, for example, to engage in further dialogue. And on the basis of, of this, we get the kinds of basic analytics that I talked about um, that are very useful for us to see that the, the tool has been useful. So we launched last September to 5,000 students and evaluated this over a 25-week period. And we got to nearly 3,500 active users, those who are um, using the portfolio regularly. And we also saw that over the period of time that we were evaluating this tool, the amount of time students were spending in the portfolio went up, suggesting that they were using more of the features and um, doing different things with the, with the tools and resources within the portfolio. We also were able to see um, differences across disciplines, for example. Um, I've got one example here of a cluster of disciplines within uh, health and medical sciences. So we could see some differences in, in terms of the assessment patterns in different modules, for example, and how that might be leading to different engagement with feedback. But the most important element of the portfolio is really this, this student-facing dashboard, um, which they see when they log into the portfolio. It shows them how many reviews they've entered, how many actions they've entered, how many are still to complete. Um, but it also gives them these visual representations of the top three things that they've been doing well in their work and the top three areas for improvement, which is based on that feedback synthesis that they complete within the um, first section. And the idea is that they can uh, track their progress, um, they can see how their engagement with feedback, what they have been doing, has had an influence both on their, their grades but also on the development of their skills, how that is changing over time. We are also analysing uh, student attainment and, and self-report measures alongside these analytics, um, but that's very much a work in progress. We've got a lot of data to, to go through from this pilot year, but we're planning to roll this out um, across the university next year to students 
Um, and we continue to involve students in the, the design and development of the portfolio. We've got a, a collaborative approach to curation at the resource bank where we encourage students to submit suggestions for uh, resources that should go in there. If they found a useful website on referencing, for example, then they're able to um, submit that suggestion and we can add that into the resource bank. So, as I said, we're going through a lot of the data at the moment, um, but there's just a couple of indications here from our, our snapshot that we took at Christmas at the midpoint, um, where we'd seen a significant increase in what we call students' cognizance, which represents their knowledge of the steps that you need to take in order to take meaningful action on feedback. We had a really good uh, level of student engagement with the project and with the use of the portfolio. And one of the reasons for this, I think, was because we took this partnership approach where the students helped to design it and it gave them ownership. So we have one student here saying, I'm, you know, I'm quite proud of what I've created and that this is going to help other students. And we also saw that students recognised the importance of their involvement in the feedback process, that feedback is not something that is done to them, but something that they need to um, take responsibility for if they're going to see uh, the impact on, on their future work. Um, so we were pleased to, to see that level of engagement um, and also we have students now who have decided to become ambassadors um, for the portfolio and talking to, to other students about how it's had an impact on them. So that's uh, a summary of, of what we've been doing. Um, we, as I said, have got a lot of data to, to go through um, and hopefully that will give us a little bit more information about how, how all these sources of information can, can come together to inform our understanding of engagement and feedback, but perhaps more importantly, how that information can help students understand their engagement and the impact that feedback can have on their work. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Naomi. I, it's fascinating. Uh, I'll just reiterate a comment. I was at all the sessions that we've heard, so I've heard them through the second time just now. And uh, one of the comments from the conference was, when can we have it? Uh, basically, that, that everybody is wanting to, you know, to, to engage in this way. Can, can I though just ask a um, one question and, and can I just say to everybody as I go, if there's any more questions, just type them in the text box or um, put, put your hand up basically if you want to speak. Um, but just my, my question, just, just from, the, uh, from the presentation uh, at the conference, am I right in thinking that, the, that this, is, this feedback has come to students in a sort of written form, not an electronic form, so they're having to actually essentially key it in again. Is that right? Uh, yes, so they are responsible for entering um, those feedback reviews in, in section one and um, they can have, they can do that with, with verbal feedback, with audio, video, written, whatever kind of form that feedback is coming. But we did feel it was really important that the student was, was entering that in. And some of the students have been saying that um, whilst at first they, they didn't really want that, um, they wanted this to be automated for them. Since they've been saying that it really sticks in my memory more because I've had to go through and, and pull out the important parts. And going back to that Fitbit analogy, um, whilst the, the activity tracker will record the number of steps that you've taken, perhaps, or the um, number of hours sleep you've had, if you want it to combine that with information about your calorie intake, you need to add that information into the system. So I think it is that important message about self-regulation and about the learner having uh, the, uh, the responsibility for entering information that's likely to be useful. I think that's actually a really important point. I, I didn't pick that point, thanks Naomi, I didn't pick that up properly at, at the conference and I think that's a really, really important point. Again, it's back to agency, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a question from Mark uh, just to come in, which is, uh, where's the dashboard? Is it is it homepage of the VLE or is it a separate URL? 
So from the student's perspective, it's within the BLE. So when they log in, um, the feedback portfolio is there within their list of courses. So it, it, it's seamlessly within the um, within the BLE from the perspective of the student. We actually built the tool within um, Storyline Scorn package, um, and from our perspective, it just allowed us to do more more things with it than the ePortfolio function within our BLE. But yeah, from the student's perspective, it's there when they when they log in. That's great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think, given the time, um, it's probably sensible for us to uh, move on to uh, just the general discussion. Um, so I'm hoping, thank you, <laughs> uh, that. Uh, so I'm just I'm just reiterating those two points that I had up at the beginning. The the idea that feedback's defined as a process through which learners make sense of information from various sources. I mean, really interesting information we've just had in, on that in the last talk. But then in, use it to in, they use it to enhance their work and learning strategies. Um, the idea of provocative feedback, that's an interesting one because in some senses we've talked about the importance of the consistency of feedback and in some senses I think feedback is is more provocative if it's, if it's less expect, expected, which is an interesting one. Um, the example that I haven't got up there which was to do with the, the point about uh, feedback being during during learning rather than at the end, I think again we've had lots of, of good examples of. Um, and there's a very interesting um, uh, point that, that uh, Teresa just picked up on, which is the idea that's been common to the three of, of the idea of uh, feedback being in the open rather than behind closed doors, which is certainly something I'd be quite interested to discuss further. Um, the other thing I'd be quite interested to discuss further, uh, just to flag it, is this idea that assessment really stops, stops being a separate event, that by providing students with information that it really is learning uh, as well as assessment. Um, however, um, what I'm going to do really for the remaining time is to throw it open to anybody who wants to speak. Um, and to say how do, what do you feel, and I'll go to the speakers first so you know, you know what's coming, how do you feel that the ideas from the conference relate to what you've said today? So I'm going to come in order back to the speakers, so I'll go to Teresa first and then Mark and then Naomi, um, and really say what do you feel, I mean just the things that pull together the themes that you gathered from the conference, anything else you heard from the conference really, and how does it relate to the work that you're doing or the work that, that you've heard about today? So, um, Teresa, I'm going to go back, come back to you first, if that's okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I certainly think one of the, the, the big themes in the conference was about feedback being a dialogue. And I think that sort of uh, links to the point I made about openness, because traditionally, you know, feedback is the, the, the student handling work, you know, in, in a, a box or in a pigeonhole or something like that. The tutor gets it, they mark it, the feedback somehow winds its way back to the student and they read it, you know, in, in private. And I think this whole idea about, about getting out there in the open I think is part of this whole thing of having more of a dialogue. There, there was, I didn't go to it, but there was a presentation at the conference from somebody who was talking about um, maybe we should use the experience that we have when we get peer review of academic papers and we should be more open about that process with the students, let them know that, that actually we're part of this whole feedback thing as well and that it's good to to talk about. It's good to talk, to pick up a, something from an advert from about 30 years ago. Um, it, yeah, it's good to get it out there in the open and, and make it more of a dialogue, either between the tutor and the student, or between the students, as, as we've seen in, in one of the talks today. I think that's really important, the idea, you know, and, and in a sense it becomes more authentic, doesn't it, if it, you know, the, the, 
it's the sort of thing that we experience in everyday life uh, as well. It's really mm. interesting, really interesting idea. Um, and, and I can't actually see I've fallen off the end of the screen who typed it. It was obviously somebody from the conference that saying that that session was excellent. Have to manage the difficult emotions in response to feedback. It is interesting because there is also a literature though around the fact that uh, one of the advantages of uh, feedback that's generated by a computer, which, you know, again, all the issues there about whether that's genuine feedback or not, um, but one of the advantages sometimes is that students feel that, 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 that you're receiving it in private rather than having to be embarrassed in front of your tutor um, who's an expert. So it's certainly an interesting thing. It's the, uh, you know, future professional life. It's, it's all very, very interesting stuff. So lots there to think about. So I think, Mark, may I hand back to you next? Uh, Anything, you know, pick up on that, that or, or anything else, indeed, from the conference? Yeah, I, I totally agree with, with Theresa. That, that point really stood out for me about the conference. Um, I'd also add another point, if you don't mind, and it's where uh, the feedback process uh, doesn't, isn't as efficient when there's uh, teacher dependency. And by that, I mean the students uh, didn't believe that they could transfer the feedback from the end of one semester in one module to another module in the next semester. And wherever we can increase student agency, like Naomi had highlighted there through the dashboard, um, and Teresa had even mentioned within her presentation the way the students actually copped on that actually if I'd done more work, I would have gotten more out of this. Wherever we can increase the student agency, I think we'll have better learning experience overall and the teaching experience from the lecturer's point of view because we'll have more, um, uh, a more engaged students. That's so important, so really important. Thanks ever so much. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? I think, and it is very much to do with this. I mean, interestingly, David's um, keynote, he did start to sort of say, well, perhaps we're using away from, moving away from the use of the word feed forward. Um, and I, as a physicist, have always been a little bit reluctant about it because true feedback is that interactive process. Um, but it's a, that, that whole um, student agency as part of the process, I think, is so very, very important. Thank you. Um, and conscious of the time, I'm just going to hand back to Naomi for, if you like, the final word on, on, the, on these subjects. Thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, there's, there's one other thing that struck me um, listening to the sessions today and how that relates back to what David Collins was saying about um, the importance of action and feedback and um, when it comes, making sure it's useful and so on. Um, and that is that the example of this technology uh, and the use of assessment and feedback that we've heard about today um, are all there because there's some particular affordance that technology gives in that context. I think one of the challenges with, with using technology and assessment and feedback is that if we're not careful, the technology can just replicate a, a transmission-focused approach to feedback, but just using audio or video. Um, but what's really nice in these examples is that dialogue is, is absolutely central, and so the use of technology has an affordance. It, it's doing something in particular that is driving that feedback practice forward to more of a dialogic model. I think that's so important, Naomi. Thank you. Um, I think. I think the um, the point I always think of in this one is that it can be so easy to get hoodwinked into using the technology because it's there. And I think it's about using technology because it, it, it does something useful, it, it helps learning. Um, and then double checking that it is. And, and we've had three absolutely brilliant examples of the importance of that now. So. Um, that's just a summary of, of who's been speaking. And I think before I quickly hand back to Matthew, um, I'll just do the plug for the next conference, which is in nearly a year in Manchester. Um, and I'm expecting that the call for proposals, if you want to speak at that conference, to be made sometime in the autumn. So we've just about made it within the hour. And I'll hand back to Matthew. 
Oops, I need to refresh the talk button. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, folks. Uh, I'm just going to paste in a link uh, for our regular feedback survey. Thank you very much for coming. Um, as just as sort of a, as a last word as well, um, the idea of feedback and student action on feedback. I believe we had a webinar on this very topic way back in about 2011 or 2012, where somebody presented a, a mechanism for getting students involved in. Uh, reacting to feedback in that, for example, that they would give uh, qualitative feedback but not release the grades until such time that the students had reacted to that feedback with a comment or you know, a reflection. So I think this idea of a dialogue um, has been in the background for quite some time, but now we're starting to see technology tools come to the fore with things like learning analytics and assessment analytics. Um, where this stuff can be really used in a much more uh, you know, powerful manner than it could in the past. So we're certainly looking forward to seeing a lot more innovation in, in this area. So thank you very much, folks. Um, what I wanted to do also was mention what was coming up in the next webinar, if I can find the link. <laughs> um, okay, so our next uh, is uh, session will be on unlocking the digital code to literacy implications for learning and assessment. So it's about digital literacies. Um, so that will be on the 1st of August. So see you then, and I'll be able to shut off the recording. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and yes, I need to go and catch the public transport too. <laughs> Bye-bye all. <laughs>